I was born here in Summerland in 1940. Uh, lived here my formative years and then went away to school. But uh, this area right here where we're sitting was um, where I was born and raised. Not in this house, but a little, little shack, so to speak. But it was good country living and thoroughly enjoyed it. But we always thought, gosh, there's a lake, there's mountains, and that's the way it is. We kind of took it for granted. My parents always used to tell me to enjoy it because this isn't what you're going to see wherever you go. And I thought, no, this is the way it is everywhere. Well, and being of um, Japanese parents, we had a outdoor um, bathhouse. And in it is a metal galvanized tub. It's square, um, about three feet wide, four feet long, and about three feet deep. You fill it with water and it sits on two concrete slabs and there's space under there where you can build a fire. In the evening, you soak in the tub. Then you get out, you wash, soap and water, and then you get back in the tub. And that's the traditional Japanese um, bathhouse. My dad started working here a hundred years ago. And he worked the orchards and never left. Now he came when he was 16. He and his family lived in the southern most part of Japan, the very southern tip. And they had a fishing fleet and they did very, very well. Well, his dad was very successful in the fishing business and he owned this whole area and he had one house and he was brought up well with a governess and a nanny and, and tutors and so on. The long and short of it was his father said, I'm getting rid of my fleet of boats and I'm going to get the first steamship in southern Japan and I can catch more fish, go out further, bring in the payload much earlier and be much more successful. He bought this huge steamship which is the biggest in southern Japan. He got caught in a typhoon or his crew did and the boat caught fire, sunk, they lost everything. My dad said, okay, we're going to rebuild. He was a teenager. He said, let me finish school. So he was very bright. And he said, I'm going to go to Canada where we have some relatives. I'm going to make some money. I'll be back in two years. And he started working. Then he started working in packing houses. One of his uncles had a packing house started there. And within two years, his goal was to go back, but his father got cancer and died. He never went back. And my mother lived just across the fence. There's a little shack down there. And her family lived there. The house is no longer there now. But that's how Dad met her, and they got married, and they settled on this property. Grade seven, Mr. Tamlin, who you may or may not have heard about, he was my grade seven teacher, and that was the first year he started in Summerland. He came from Toronto. He was a music major but he came as a school teacher. And one day in school, 
he announced to our class, our grade seven class, he said, I'm going to start a band. He thought, okay, good luck. When I get a few instruments, I'm going to have them on a table. I want you people to come by and look at them. You don't have to play in the band. You don't have to do anything, but please come by and just look. So we went there and Mr. Tamlin was standing there and the two of us, we looked and he looked at me and said, um, I think you should play a brass instrument. He said, try this. And I picked it up and, and it was one of these. It was a E flat alto horn. Well, a week or two later, he said, all right, I have several people that want to be in the band, and here's how it's going to work. We will provide the instruments, and we'll teach you how to play them. You don't have to know a thing, but we'll do it twice a week. So you're going to miss class twice a week. My buddy and I looked at each other and said, hey, that works. We don't have to go to that math class or that social studies or French. We can get up and we can go to band. Who cares if we know how to play? So that's what we did. We signed up for band. More people than you could shake a stick at signed up, probably because of that little caveat that you could miss class. Well, being E flat alto, I played the alternate beat with my horn. And the tubas and the basses played the first note. And we were the rhythm of the band, but in but the trumpets and the clarinets got all the melody. They played the song. The trombones, the baritones, the tenor sax, they played the counter melody. Well, I come home and I practice. I practice my E flat, and my mom and dad would sit and listen to me, and they said, when are you going to play music? I said, that's my music. They said, oh, couldn't you play something different? And my sister, who was three years older, she said, play the French horn. I said, what is that? She said, it's that round thing, you know, with the bell, and you hold it like this. And beautiful. Well, I love the beauty of it. So I went to Mr. Tamlin, and I said, can I play French horn? He said, well, one day he comes in with this case. He says, here's your French horn. I look at it. It's beautiful, fancy, you know. E flat, alto, and French will play the same music. You're keyed in F, they're keyed in E flat, but you're going to play the same music. And the sound that comes out will be the same sound as what that one is. So it worked perfectly. He said, yeah, play the French horn. I thought, oh, I've been bamboozled. So anyways, I got home and my mom and dad said, good, we're getting you a trumpet. You can play the French horn because I got it for you, but play a trumpet so we can hear some music. So they bought me a second-hand trumpet. I played it. Finally, in the grade nine, I told Mr. Tamlin, I said, I'm going to play trumpet in the band. He says, no, you're not. He said, you're first chair of the alto section. You're the French horn. You're playing it. And I said, mom and dad won't let me. He said, OK, we'll try it for a while. So next band practice, I'm in the trump section, and I'm way at the back, you know, because I'm the newbie. Right? He said, Eddie, I want you to sit up. So I went to the second row, second trumpet, where there's about six or eight of us. And I sat on the far end, and I played there for maybe a month. He said, Eddie. Come on up. I want you in the first row. And I thought, oh, these guys have been playing three years, and I'm the new guy, and you want me up here? 
So I sat on the end and I played. The guys beside me, you know, they were seniors and so on. About a month goes by and he says, Eddie, I want you over here. I want to hear you better. I said, you can hear me down there. He says, no, I want you up here. First trumpet. Oh, jeez. And these other guys looking at me like, hey, he just got here. What's going on? Um, you know, band travel was not heard of back then. In fact, travel anywhere was not heard of. He said, we're going to Victoria and we're going by plane. Well, most of us had never been on an airplane, right? He chartered two North Star airplanes, big guys, and two box trucks. He put all the instruments and everything in the box trucks and they drove to Victoria. The band flew in two charter planes. And we went to Victoria for a music festival and there was probably 20 bands there. And they just raved about the Summerland band, how good it was and they didn't take a back seat to any of them. And we played some pretty hard music. And so on our way back, we, of course, landed in Vancouver. And the mayor of Vancouver asked Mr. Tamlin if he would have our band come to City Hall. And we were in front of City Hall, and the mayor and the dignitaries came out, and we played for them. And why he chose us, I still don't know why, but we played for Mayor Hume, who was mayor back then. Well, baseball was really important to the community. Back when, um, even before I was born, a, a baseball was organized uh, to the point where the teams were excellent up and down the valley, all over the place. And this was before television. So what did you have? You listen to baseball on radio. Right? Or you listen to hockey on radio. But spring, summer, early fall, what sport did you play? It was baseball. And I remember my dad being part of the, of the Japanese team. There was a pretty good contingent of Japanese people here in Summerland. And the first games that I remember as a kid, and that's probably when I was four, five, baseball was played in Crescent Beach. Now Crescent Beach was this flat peninsula of land perfectly flat with the North Beach and the Side Beach, right? Few houses, but nothing in the middle. There was no grass, because it was all clay. You see the clay cliffs? Well, the clay made up that peninsula. And then in the 50s, there's Baseball is getting bigger and so on. Summerland had three teams, a Japanese team, a senior team, and a junior baseball team. And they're all good. And they said, we need a better baseball diamond. They looked around and they developed Memorial Baseball Park. So the baseball teams moved up to that. That was a big day. I remember exactly when they went up there. It was huge. The grandstands were filled. Because what else did you have? Right? That was far before television. And you wanted to hear baseball, you're going to hear New York Yankees and the Brooklyn Dodgers on the radio once a week. That's all you're going to get. Yeah. 
So baseball was big all over North America. And Summerland was no exception. That's what entertainment was, was baseball in the ballpark on Sundays, always a game on Sunday. But growing up as a kid, that was the first thing we did at towards the end of winter. If we thought the snow was going to be melting, we brought our gloves, baseball and a glove to school. Before school, recess, lunch hour, second recess, we would throw the ball. The flume in the Okanagan was a standard. It was an icon. And the reason for that is the orchards. Flumes carried water. And everything was gravity, right? Everything flowed downhill. So flumes were developed at the high point, and then they flowed to the lower point. And the flume was made out of metal. You had stands, you had these curved metal flumes that were probably about 30 to 40 feet right in the flume. It was big enough where we could actually, if it was enough water, say, at the start of the flume, the flume would be this deep. And it's a semicircle. So the water would be up to here. And then as it goes, people are tapping off of it, right? So if you're off at the top end, you could actually float down that flume. But you had to be careful because the flumes had little crossbars. So you had to keep your head down and what we used to do is, in the hot days, we'd lie in there and go floating down the flume. When we got bigger, we'd have our little boats. And you'd start up there and you'd run down beside the flume and you'd catch it half a mile down there. We would go down the road, play with our friends. I didn't want to go all the way around. I didn't have a bike. You had to walk. So you go on the flume and you'd walk it. Sometimes they'd have planks of people would walk along the flume. Sometimes there wasn't. There's just the edge. And not much of an edge. And those that were daring would walk along that edge over the deep ravine or gully. But that was that was big entertainment when we were kids. And my mother had arranged a meeting with the Dean of Dentistry from Manitoba because BC didn't have a school of dentistry. And I met him at the old Incola Hotel in Penticton, which is now gone. But he, um, he told me that if I was interested in dentistry, I should go there. Well, as you grow and you, your thoughts are different, and I thought, gee, no, I don't think I want to be a dentist. And I thought about marine biology, uh, which I really liked because I worked for the hatcheries in the summer, and it was a it was a wonderful job. I also wanted to be an architect. I loved drawing and sketching and. I thought, gosh, if I could make a living this way, it's perfect. Well, I had a friend who was two years older than I, and he wanted to be an architect. So he joined the School of Architecture at UBC. And I thought I would just follow behind and be an architect student. But he said, uh, after two years, he said, Eddie, don't do it. So I kept switching in my mind what I wanted to do, and then I thought about dentistry again. And a lot of the students said, uh, you can get into dentistry, but why don't you try for medicine? Go for that. If you don't get in, go into dentistry. 
I didn't know how it worked, but anyways, I went with the crowd and uh, went into medicine, and there I was. That was my career. And I did a rotating internship at Los Angeles. That was a wonderful year. I went through different services like medicine, surgery, urology, dermatology, diabetes, all the disciplines. So you learned something about everything. And I did a year of general surgery in Bakersfield, California. And when you do a year of general surgery, you then go through different specialties in surgery, like neurosurgery, plastic surgery, urology, general surgery, so on. And I kind of liked it, but I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. But the head of the program at Kern County came to me and said, you want to be a heart surgeon? I said, no, I don't. He said, yes, you do. And uh, he said, can you go to Houston? I said, yeah, I can go anywhere, but why would I want to be a heart surgeon? I knew nothing about it. We didn't do heart surgery, didn't do any in Winnipeg. It was a new thing. And they're just starting to do some transplants and so on. Exciting, but new territory. And I thought, well, I'll go to Baylor in Houston and I'll look at it. And he had a spot for me. And I'd make rounds home every morning and every night, and we'd operate all day long. And I thought, you know, it's wonderful, wonderful stuff. We met patients from all over the world. But I thought, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. So, come the end of the year, he said, um, you're leaving? I said, yep, I'm going back to Bakersfield, do some more general surgery, then I'm going to go into orthopedic surgery. And he was an East Texas guy with a real Texas drawl, and he said, well, dang it. He says, you're not going to do heart surgery, stay here. I said, I don't have a spot. And he said, we'll see about that. And he called the department chair and they asked me to come in. They said, you want to be an orthopedic surgeon? I said, yes. I've had some experience in it and that's what I want to do. They said, can you start January the 1st, which is a few days ago. I said, where? I said, we just made you a spot. So naturally, I was busy coming right out of the chute. And I'd, I'd be busy till 2 in the morning, go home, get some sleep, and start off again at 6. And this was my life, a little different than heart surgery, but I loved it. And joint replacements were just coming in at that time. And we did the very first total knee replacements. I was one of the surgeons with Dr. Granberry, who was the other surgeon. We did the first total knee replacement in Houston in 1972. So that was my life in orthopedics. But as I was saying, you sort of head in directions that you like. And I thought, I don't want to see sore backs every day. So I got out of spine surgery. I got out of neck surgery. I said, I don't want to look at feet all day. So I got out of feet. And sports medicine was just starting in the late 70s, early 80s. And I said, no, that's what I really like. Well, we learned arthroscopy. And uh, that changed the world of orthopedics. A quick funny story, we came up with the Houston Hurricane 
to play Vancouver Whitecaps. And it was a beautiful day in May. We played in Empire Stadium. And they had a sellout, 34,000 fans. Well, me coming up, I took my little daughter and she sat in the stands with my parents who drove down to Vancouver to watch the game because I'd be there. Well, being a team doctor, I had to sit on the bench with the players. That was the rule. Halfway through the game, or partway into the game, one of our players goes down. And I saw the play. I didn't think he was injured very badly, if at all. Well, I can't go out on the field until the referee gives a white flag. That's my signal to go out there. Well, the white flag comes out, so I have to run out in the field. And I look at this player and I say, Manuel, what happened? He says, I'm okay. Well, the trainer, his name was Randy, says, Manuel, stay down. I said, Randy, what happened? What's going on? He said, is your family here? I said, yeah. He said, they're in the stands? I said, yes. He said, Doc, I just wanted you to get some field time. I said, Randy, let's, let's get out of here. This guy's okay. And he stands up and he runs off the field. And we walk off like we did something for him. We didn't do a thing. He wanted me to get out there so my family could see me. Well, my wife, who worked with me in surgery, was my nurse, my first assistant in surgery, my clinical nurse. We would travel to all the hospitals I worked in. We carpool, obviously, because we always went to the same place. If I went to surgery, she was with me. I never used another doctor. I used her because she knew everything about it. She could do the operation. She was a surgical assistant but she always assisted me, and I worked perfectly. So we had a wonderful career doing that. We used to travel from Texas to here every summer. And then when we started getting dogs, we got golden retrievers, and we didn't want to leave them at home or in a pen or in a kennel. So we thought, how do we do this? We thought, well, we'll try a motor home. And they can travel with us. The only issue was it took five days to travel from Houston to here. And that's half your vacation, right? It got to the point as I went on in practice, I was a senior member. And I could call my own shots. So I said, okay, folks. You know, I come up here every summer. I'm going to take more time. I said, take all the time you want. So, we got a little bigger motorhome. We got two dogs. We travel five days up. We spend five weeks here. And we had no problem spending our summers here. And then later they said, you're going to retire. What are you going to do? I said, We're going north. Summers are wonderful. I said, what about winters? I said, it's four seasons. We love the seasons. And when we moved up here, I said to my wife, Anita, I said, you want to spend a week or two or a month or two south? You know, we've got a motor home. We can do that. Um, or stay here. She said, I love the seasons. And like my parents said, there's nothing like it here. And they were right. 